And a hearty hello and welcome to one and all. This is episode four of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. So some people have asked me how a kind of scrappy Jewish kid from the suburbs growing up in the late 1970s and then through the 80s, like myself, would have become such a fan of the, well, one of the two gentlemen on my hat here, uh, not Superman, although I one of the first movies I ever saw in a movie theater was Superman the movie, 1978, Christopher Reeve. My parents took, that's actually the first movie that I went to with both parents at the dearly departed Movies at Sunrise Mall, Massapequa, uh, way back in December of 1978, I believe. The other guy on the hat is the late, great Muhammad Ali, who I spoke of at length the other day. But a question could come up. I wasn't old enough to have ever realistically seen him fight or watched one of his fights live. How did I become a fan? And there's actually a special significance of today as there was the other day. Not as serious, but an interesting historical story that, believe it or not, ties into the Karate Kid and Cobra Kai, of all things. But the story of how I became such a fan of the man formerly known as Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr., later Muhammad Ali, three-time world heavyweight champion, 1960 Olympic gold medalist, uh, humanitarian, person who for a time was the most hated man in the country, and then one of its most beloved um, receiving the nation's highest honor in 2005, what is known as the Congressional Medal of Freedom for his humanitarian uh, efforts around the globe. The story goes, when I was about six years old, this would have been uh, tax season of 1980. My dad was a CPA. He worked at a big firm in Manhattan at the time. Um, I won't name the firm, a little bit notorious. But this one particular day, and bear in mind, 1980, computers were kind of in their infancy. When a kid, age six, went to work with his dad, he didn't have um, screens to keep him company. He didn't have Game Boys or any kind of electronic devices where they had tiny little like football and baseball games, but I didn't have one of those. That was maybe a year away from me getting those. So I was really good at those games. It was just nothing but dots on the screen that you controlled. Not very exciting. But on this particular day, presumably I started whining and complaining about the fact that I was bored, dad's working, and my usual nonsense, my irritating little redhead kid routine. So one of the other CPAs there, I don't remember what he looked like. Of course, he probably seemed really old because I was six Anybody over like 20 was ancient as far as I was concerned. So this gentleman named Marshall um, asked my dad, hey, is, is Jeremy a, a fan of boxing? My dad remembered that I had watched the first, as ridiculous as this is, the first fight between Marvin Hagler and Vito Antifermo, uh, which ended in a draw. And I was on the edge of my seat. So dad presumably said something like, well, yeah, why? Marshall had a number of boxing magazines, whether it was Ring Magazine, Boxing Illustrated, um, but he had a number of magazines, and he said, well, Jer, if you, would, if you would like to read, you might find some of this stuff interesting. You know, I, I don't really have any use for these. Would you, like, would you like these copies? Well, sure. So he gave me, uh, I believe it was three magazines, but there was one in particular which caught my eye, and even though Ali was, he was in that netherworld where he had defeated Spinks for the third time uh, and then retired, but before he unfortunately came back um, to face Larry Holmes in 1980. So at this point, he was sort of semi-retired, and the magazine that I read, cover to cover three times that day, uh, was kind of a career retrospective, going back to his early days with the Olympics, and the Cassius Clay days, and then him changing his name. And there were so many vivid pictures. And for a little kid like me who had a vivid imagination, I was overwhelmed. And um, reading about him, 
learning about his life, the ups and downs, the crazy swings of good and bad, and in some cases, ugly, I was riveted. And I became a lifelong fan that day and started asking my mother to take me to the local libraries in Massapequa so that I could take out books on him and books on boxing and to learn as much as I could. So I was, even as a child, very much an all or nothing kind of a personality. And when I was interested in something, I know it's a cliche, but I wanted to know as much as I could. So I began studying his life and you know, looking for, were there movies with him? Is there anything that I can watch? And I would actually check out all of the TV listings to see if there was anything featuring him. And occasionally ESPN would play a classic fight and I always wanted to see that. Again, it's nothing like now where you have, for example, a six or seven year old boy who is interested in a particular, it doesn't have to be an athlete, it could be an actor. You can find enormous amounts of information at the click of a button. It could be on your phone at any time and have limitless levels of, of knowledge that you can that you can glean. But back then it was a little bit a little bit more difficult. It took more research in a library and hoping that the local library had books and maybe magazines and stuff like that. So that is how I became a lifelong fan, learning about what he did, what he didn't do, the controversies, uh, the highs, the lows. And, um, you know, he was only like 35 or 36 that day that I read all that information. But, you know, in a sport like boxing, especially back then, because now you have fighters that are still that are still at a very high level well into their 30s. But back then, it seemed like guys were, as they say, on the other side of the mountain when they were in their mid-30s. And in his case, certainly he should have been retired by 34 without question. So with that being said, and understanding the kind of backdrop of my lifelong appreciation and really lifelong study of this man's life, when I was in second grade, I wrote a biography on him. I used to do book reports. Uh, I talked about him as much as possible in academic settings because it was something that I was excited about and interested in. And um, it never felt like work. It's a cliche. You know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. The number of times that I did school projects where he was the central figure was not a coincidence and not an accident. So, yeah, that's that's how it began when I was just a little boy. And um, to this day, I, I consider myself a scholar. I have read and absorbed enormous amounts of information um, about his life and legacy. So, with that being said, on this day, 1962, a 20-year-old Cassius Clay, uh, just about a little over two years past his um, Olympic gold medal win in the light heavyweight class, I should point that out. You know, his future pals and rivals, more so George Foreman. But one of the kind of ironies of, of Ali's career is that he won the Olympics in 1960 as a light heavy. So kind of a scrawny kid with incredible ability. You know, he as he... Before the Olympics, he was beating guys 30, 40, 50 pounds heavier than him. He was just an absolute master, monster in the ring, even with being undersized. But he won the light heavyweight gold medal. And then in the next Olympics, Joe Frazier in Tokyo won the heavyweight gold medal. And in the next Olympics, George Foreman, the Mexico City Olympics, he won a gold medal in the heavyweight class. So it's like there are stretches where somebody winning an Olympic gold does not necessarily translate to a great career. Or somebody that, that kind of flamed out in the Olympics having a great career. But, man, three consecutive Olympics, you had American guys winning gold and then going on to stupendous professional careers. And, I mean, is Joe Frazier a top ten heavyweight ever? I don't know. But certainly Ali and Foreman. Most people have Ali either first or second. And Big George, especially with his incredible comeback, has he has a claim to that as well. So, on this day, 1962, Cassius Clay, age 20, fought against the light heavyweight champion who was well into his 40s. No, his name is Archie Moore, and he had one of the great nicknames in the history of sports. He was the old mongoose. I mean, what a great nickname, the old mongoose, Archie Moore. But Moore holds the record for most, most knockouts in a career, and he was a guy 
We talked about Mike Spinks the other day having no chance against, uh, of course, Mike Tyson at his absolute peak. Archie Moore was a guy who fought at light heavyweight but could more easily hold his own against real heavyweights, you know, the Rocky Marcianos. He actually, in a fight he lost, he actually knocked Rocky Marciano down in a fight in 56. I believe it was the last fight of Rocky's career, if I'm not mistaken, retiring 49-0. But Archie Moore's professional career was slowing down, and young Cassius Clay was managed by a group of Louisville businessmen. And Archie Moore was interested in working with him. They weren't going to, it wasn't like antagonistic. Archie wanted to work with him. Hey, maybe the kid can learn something. And Archie was known for kind of unconventional training methods. And I'm sure somebody told Cassius, you know, be ready for anything. You know, the old mongoose, he's, he's going to make you do some weird shit. And probably, because the kid was so excited all the time. And he was such a, he had such an incredible work ethic. You know, first in the gym, last to leave kind of a guy. He was just excited to work with Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore. You know, he's very polite. Like when he met Sugar Ray Robinson, he always called him Mr. Robinson, Mr. Robertson. Um, so young Cassius Clay began training with the light heavyweight champion, Archie Moore. And the Karate Kid Cobra Kai twist that I teased, I kind of feel like the writer of the Karate Kid and the filmmakers took something from the, the story of Cassius Clay and Archie Moore because it's it's too on the nose for it to have not for it to have not been part of it. So the way that Archie would teach Cassius not just how to train, how to condition himself for a 10 round fight, a 12 round fight, or if he really made it a 15 round fight, he wanted the kid to understand that sometimes you just have to do stuff you don't want to do that it doesn't directly relate to boxing, to jogging, to sparring, to heavy bag work, to medicine ball work. But it has to do with being able to follow instructions from your trainer when maybe you don't want to. So Archie was having the kid do his household chores. Hey, young Cassius thought he was just going to be learning how to fight. And there's some terrific pictures of the two guys training together. You know, and Archie looked so much older because he was. He was at least 25 years older. It was one of those where... Archie Moore was either 43 or 45 or 48, depending on which birth certificate, wink, wink, you, you went by. So after a certain amount of time of Cassius doing everything for Archie, picking up his laundry, folding his clothes, cleaning his toilets, doing all of this stuff, which he found to be not only a waste of time, but kind of degrading, he told his his management team, he says, basically, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm barely sparring. I'm barely doing anything related to fighting. I'm just, I'm working for Archie Moore. He might as well hire a maid because I, I'm, I'm like his maid and his cleaning person at the same time. So Cassius left Archie. And then, as you would expect, because the kid already talked a lot, he was known now. He's a wise guy. The kid never shuts up. He started saying stuff, I want that old man. And then Archie said, all right, you know what? Let's go, kid. Let's let's fight. You know, you got a problem with me. You don't like my training methods. We're going to rumble. We're going to do this. And let's just see what happens. <laughs> so it goes from, it would be like in The Karate Kid, if after Daniel learns how to fight, he gets so frustrated that he and Mr. Miyagi have, a, have like a brawl. You know, how dumb would that be? But that's what happened here. So there was a lot of chatter before the fight. And um, Clay, it was one of his most uh, famous predictions. He predicted that he was going to stop Archie Moore in the fourth round. And this was something that he had already become known for, where he would predict the round that the fight would end. And to that point in his career, he was doing it. If he said, I'm going to stop this guy in two, he would go down in two. So he was comfortable enough, even though Archie was still a top-level fighter, he was a lot lighter, a lot older, and slower. And the quote was, don't block the aisle. Don't block the door. Archie Moore will fall in four. And um, on the night of the fight, Archie went out there thinking, you know what? This kid's way too fast. I mean, look, I trained him. I was with this guy. He's as fast as lightning. He could take a shot, too. I'm going to have to get lucky and just square him up and land a home run bomb and hope that I put his lights out and he doesn't get back up. Because if the fight goes more than a few rounds, I can't keep up with him anyway. Uh, it's going to get ugly. So Archie had no illusions. He may have been talking a big game, but he knew that the odds that he could beat him was very, very slim. He could see the way the kid could throw those shots. And man, if you watch footage of this fight, 
He does not look like a 20-year-old kid who's working on his craft. He looks like a finished product. The Cassius Clay was vicious in there. He's throwing, not even bombs, but he's just throwing these slicing, cutting, downward darts. He was very good at opening cuts because he was usually taller than his opponent. He's sort of just vicious, downward darts. And he was so sharp with his punches. He didn't waste effort. He didn't throw haymakers that would leave him open to attack. So, you know, the way it works is that Archie starts taking a lot of shots. And he's crouching down. And as the fight goes on, <laughs> he's crouching more and more just as part of trying to defend himself. He almost looked like he was trying to, like, go into a shell. And there's a point where he's he's simply dodging punches, and it's it's almost a knockdown. Like, he's so close to the canvas. Like, he doesn't know what else to do. He can't move away. So he's just crouching and crouching and crouching and crouching. So finally, it gets to round four, and the kid is just all over him, and he knocks him down three times. And even though I don't believe there was a three-knockdown rule in this fight, um, the referee waved it over. So Archie wasn't thrown back, and there was no reason to let it continue. The kid wasn't out there to hurt the guy. And you could see he started to feel bad for Archie, but you know what? He had to end it. He didn't want to take any chances because Archie was still winning. And... When the fight ended, the two men embraced. And, you know, it's part of both, and they're both legends. I mean, Archie Moore, many people to this day will say, that's the greatest light heavyweight who ever lived. Archie Moore, the old mongoose. But they embraced after the fight. And then, ironically, a dozen years later, when Ali famously in Zaire, in the Rumble in the Jungle, took on George Foreman, uh, Archie was in George's corner. And Archie... We don't know what was in his heart, but presumably he was pulling for the guy that he was working with, was George Foreman. And on that night, and that's a whole other story, but when the fight came to an end, there was some controversy because it, if you look at the video, it appears that Foreman beats the count, uh, and the fight was waved over. And there was a lot of screaming and carrying on from Foreman's corner as Ali's being running you know, around the ring and he's celebrating. And um, Moore was once asked, you know, what were your thoughts? You you saw the same count as everyone else. It looks like George is up at nine. You didn't you didn't complain. Why not? And Archie again, a man who had so many fights. He had probably close to two hundred professional fights in his career, and he still had all of his wits about him, which was that in and of itself was extraordinary. And when he was asked why didn't you complain along with the rest of George's team, if he got up before ten and he looked like he wanted to go. And Archie said, it might as well have been 10. There wasn't any reason for it to continue. It was enough. George had, George had lost, and there's no reason to just continue. So Archie was a guy, like Ali, who he would be waving the, the referee in to stop fights. It's like you're trying to win, and yes, in the moment, you are trying to, you're trying to incapacitate your opponent. But... The, there's levels of savagery, and in Archie Moore's estimation, that particular night, George took enough. And when he fought the young Cassius Clay in 62, he'd had enough. And there wasn't any reason, there wasn't any reason for the Foreman fight to continue, and in 62, there was no reason for, for Clay and Moore to go any further. So, that is going to bring episode four to a close. I hope you've enjoyed a little backstory as to how I became a fan of of this gentleman up here, and um, how the Karate Kid seemed to appropriate a little bit, and there's nothing wrong with it, you know, we see it all the time, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking real history, real popular culture, and turning it into fiction. That Archie Moore was a little bit of a Mr. Miyagi, but unlike Daniel LaRusso, young Cassius Clay was just too much of his own person to take those kinds of orders from somebody if it didn't make sense. Stuff had to make sense to him, even as a 20-year-old kid. So this has been episode four of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. Hope you enjoyed my little walk back through time. And um, hope you all having a great Thursday. And I'll see you very, very soon. Take care.